Are we set? Okay. Good afternoon. Let's try it again. Good afternoon. All right. This is Georgia, right? 12 June 1994. One day closer to victory against the New World Order. Well, first of all, we're going to have a... I always start and end all of our meetings with a prayer. If you would all stand, please. Dear and Heavenly Father, we trust that you will watch over these patriots this day, that you will protect them on their way home, that you will protect them during this meeting, that you will gird them with strength, that they might become firebrands for the Republic, that they might go to other people, they might speak to them, that they might understand the truth and the words that we discussed today. We hope that in your eyes we shall prosper, and that with your hand we shall rise up and once again become a great nation. We know full well that this is going to be a great work and a great deed. That we as brothers and sisters are going to have to march a long and cold road when the time comes. But we know, Lord, when we are through, that the prize is great and most assuredly just. That this nation is deserving only if its people work for that goal. And that great work will require great effort, great sacrifice when the time comes. We trust, Lord, that you will show us the shining path, that you will instill in our hearts an iron that we might forge this great nation once again to lead other nations in peace, to show them how a limited constitutional republic is to work in your eyes. For as long as we follow your banner, most assuredly, freedom will reign. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now wait. Don't sit down. <laughs> We haven't said the Pledge of Allegiance. We always do this. When we do it, there is one thing that I would like you to do. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, one nation under God, not one nation under God, one nation under God. There's no comma there, okay? I know it's hard to work on. We all, we're all conditioned in school, too. One nation under God, indivisible. If you would, please follow me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we'll fight for it. Amen. Well, as I said, it's the 12th, a long way into the clock. As all of you have probably seen some of what I've done in the past, much of what we've discussed is already in motion or in fruition in the enemy's camp. Most of what we discussed in the original American Peril tape and have discussed in private circles is now a common household word or is known in the general media or is even being spoken openly by our enemy amongst us. Two years ago and three years ago, we had tried to inform people about the MJTF police about FinCEN, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, about United Nations forces in the United States. All these things not only have been admitted to, but are being expounded upon as a good thing, that we must surrender our sovereignty as Americans, that we shall surrender this nation to the New World Order. Well, two years ago, they might have thought they could have gotten away with it. Your enemy is actually shaking a tad bit now. For we've been in all 50 states at one time or another, and trust me, I have seen this thousands of times over. You as patriots of the United States are not alone. From all walks of life, from all age groups, from all corners, from as far as the northern part of Michigan to the southern tip of Florida I've traveled, from the far eastern parts of the states all the way to the, all the, way to the Atlantic, to California, to Arizona, to Idaho, South Dakota, all of those states and more possess patriots in mass numbers. They are organized, they are moving, even as we speak, to come together as a common people against a common enemy. I personally will, if need be, fight and die to protect and defend the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. I prefer to make the other side fight and die trying to take it away. And I plan on living to see the end of it so that when the time comes, we will be able to enforce a limited republic here in the United States. That republic, though, cannot stand without good people backing it. 
too long, and we've seen this time and again, people have used the uh, socialist committee concept, pointing to the right or the left in one big circle, and nobody taking responsibility, nobody understanding their obligation. Well, in order for the Constitution to stand, as all of our founding fathers said, it's only as good as the people who stand behind it. We hold a shining banner that all of the world could possess if our own politicians supported it. But when was the last time you've heard in any way, shape, or form any of our primary dignitaries espousing our form of government? Any time in the last year, two years, five years, 10 years? I see gray hair here, and I know that it's been a long time since we've heard of anybody looking forward to trying implementing and, in fact, demonstrating how our constitutional form of government should run, and also trying to take it to other people. We are a peaceful nation. In fact, we are great friends in time of peace. But as George Washington said, we are your worst enemy, your worst nightmare in times of war. The New World Order is most assuredly your enemy. If they have their way, they will take your homes. They will take the children that I see sitting here. I have four, and I know they fully intend to take them from me also when the time comes that they will take away the God-given rights that we are born with, that are unalienable, not inalienable, unalienable. Even if the document is burned today, even were it shredded and, and torn asunder, those rights are yours. They were granted to us by our Creator, not by other men. And surely I have had many arguments with people, especially on call-in shows, trying to tell me all about how those were granted by men and that we really don't have unalienable rights on several occasions. Well, for a fact, the Americas are awakening. The reason I say Americas, I'm going to pass this out. I have little things I can hand out as we go. From Quebec, if you would, please. From all of the provinces of Canada, we've had mail. Don't think that the American peril tape didn't just sit inside the United States. We've had people from Scotland, from Japan, so one person said, why would a person from Japan want American peril? Well, a lot of people overseas in Australia, New Zealand, are also fed up with the New World Order. They're finished with it. They've suffered longer under the yoke than you have. Our brothers to the north in Canada have progressively watched their nation fall into the abyss. They are the reflection of our future. From socialized medicine to socialized transportation to a single resource for food, totally controlled by the state. And in reality, let me put something very bluntly here, also controlled by England. Your old nemesis, your old enemy still standing again once more before you. We may call it the New World Order, but it is in reality the monarchies, the principalities, and other nations that we have faced in the past that are seeking revenge and have a very long memory. The, way, the reason I would argue this, let me put it in, in, in simple terms that are, that are pretty straightforward whenever anybody wants to debate it. Socialism, communism, fascism are all shadows, shadows of our form of government. How can you sell anything like that with this constitutional republic in place? We have been a very tough nut to crack when you think about it. Three times they've created wars upon wars upon wars to try and alter us. And I watched television before I came up here. And I saw a reflection of 1939 and 1940 in what they are trying to do with Korea right now. Korea is the next effort and is a fatal effort, if need be, for them. For them, if necessary, to alter our path, and the way to do it if all else fails, is with violence. Now, in the past, they've used other campaigns. They've, in fact, they've been very slick. They've been very smooth. You'll notice that they've always worked with the three-step method, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. But you'll also notice something about your enemy most recently. Have you noticed how he's gotten rather nervous and he's moving faster? How he ignores his normal patterns? And in fact, my, my position is that he feels plastic. Traditionally, they would at least create the illusion of conflict, of, of A and B fighting against each other and coming up with C. Now, in their concern to get everything done quickly, they have thrown the facade away. And you'll notice that now they do not propose. They state that this is what they will do, that this is what you will do. 
and do not argue and do not debate. There's a reason that fear that they're experiencing is being projected throughout their entire infrastructure because patriots as they stand are virtually all over the country moving in this, in this direction now as a common people. We are running a race. Now, probably the best example I can think of is a, a shall we say, overfed predator who has been feeding on the herd for a long time and felt that he had all the time he needed to get take care of the rest of the pack. Well, unfortunately, while he's been lazing, we've been moving. And so the beauty of it is that we're on the run. Now, just in the last few months, and I can say this, I think, quite, quite reasonably, in the last few months, they have finally perceived our existence. And so the lazed predator is now starting to move and rumble, but we are already on the run. We need not be a lap ahead of the enemy. We only need be three steps ahead to win. So even as things are developing, they are going to change, and we're going to have to change with them in order to stay three steps ahead. Now, the best example of that is if I told you a year and a half ago when we said uncategorically the Brady Bill was a done deal, everybody said, well, it'll never happen in my lifetime. Cha-ching. The NAFTA Treaty. Boy, wasn't that a close vote? It was neck and neck. Remember those news pro the news programs, the interviews, and all the different editorials and articles? It's going to be close. It's going to be close. It's going to be 30 votes more than they needed. The illusion of competition, which did not exist. Now, so as, it, as these have taken place, we also saw, of course, the higher taxes. Everybody's familiar with that. The crime bill. Now, in talking to some of our people back east who already talked to the Schumer committee, the crime bill may already be finished and will probably be, could be signed as early as the middle of next week. No changes were made. Nothing was taken out. And as soon as we can get more information on that, we're, of course, going to burst that out to the rest of the country. What that means is that whole categories of firearms will be illegal. Whatever you do have is all that you have in certain categories. And this includes, of course, standard battle rifles or militia arms. They're not really assault rifles. Anybody who's familiar with firearms knows that you have to have that second click in the selector in order to make them what they are what they're supposedly what they supposedly are fully automatic weapons. They're not. Not that it wouldn't mind if you assault weapons right now, but uh, the fact of the matter is that what we're looking at are laws that will restrict to an even greater extent the militia arms of the people. Why? Why is there such a great priority to disarm the American people right now? Let me ask you something simple here. You've all seen the health care plan, and I don't have to use my words. You all watched him on television show you the card. That is a national ID card, national death sentence mechanism. One, nobody will receive any treatment without the card, period. Number two, well, if you don't have it, don't leave home without it. No business transactions, no activities, no participating in school, no health plan, no other health plan can substitute it. It is absolute tyranny because only the government controls it. And that is tyranny. Now, have they tried to get around this? Well, even as we speak, if you'll recall here two weeks ago, they proposed what? Well, it's not a different card, but taking the similar, the similar concept, and if this gentleman has a house loan with the government, if the young gentleman there has a school loan, he should have an ID card. We should punish him. And what they're trying to get everybody else to do, divide and conquer, is convince everybody else that that man needs a card because he's borrowing your money. Well, what's good for the goose is good for the goosey, as we say. And once he gets the card, well, we can't discriminate. He, all he needs to do is go to court. We can't discriminate. So we'll go to court, and what they will justify is that, well, you're right, we can't discriminate against this man. You all have to have the card. That's how statutory law works today. And one way or another, the camel's nose is already in the door. Everybody should have paid attention. Wednesday, the health plan went through its first phase approval. So contrary to everybody's belief that we've stopped it, remember, once government proposes something they've never seen a law they didn't like. And one way or another, once in motion, they'll continue to push it. Now, will we get all of the original Hillarite uh, Clintonista plan? Maybe not. But we will get is enough of it that it will do great damage to us. In Canada, where I'm from, or where I'm, where I'm on the edge of right now, not from, thank you, Lord. Where we are on the border, Canadians come across to buy their food. Canadians come across to buy their gasoline. Even though it's only a tank full of gas, they save a tremendous amount of money. So whenever possible, they come across and buy in the United States. Also, 
if they're a little gray haired like the gentleman right here, or there's another gentleman in the back, and all of a sudden you found out tomorrow that you needed uh, dialysis, which is still the best example because it's such a simple disease to deal with. If you needed dialysis and you're over 51 years old, you do not receive it. You are not user friendly nor maintenance friendly. Now, that would be a death sentence, were it not for the fact that because of the free American system that we have here, Canadians can come, come over with their limited resources and limited money and buy the service that's necessary to keep them alive. But what do you think is going to happen when all of a sudden our border goes like this because our medical plan cannot be used unless you have our medical card? It makes the death sentence stick, doesn't it? That and 386 other diseases that are involved that if you require treatment and you're over a certain age, you will not get. Now for all of you that are younger, you better remember something. You're all coming around to that age eventually. It's okay when it's somebody else. All of a sudden when it's you, well, it's not fair. Well, they're counting on, again, dividing and conquering. I concentrate on this, I concentrate on, this on a regular basis because this is the first point that they need. They need to get rid of the old people. Why do they need to get rid of the old people? Well, that's right. That's walking books. That's walking knowledge. When they rewrite history, when they refabricate history, when they reconstruct anything that has already been a living experience for this man and for that gentleman back there, or for that woman over there on the far side, then all of a sudden, you're going to have people like that and that and that standing up and saying, wait a minute, I was here when that happened. That's a crock of you know what. Well, they can't afford to have that because sometimes people still listen. And in fact, to be quite honest, I have shut off my TV at home. I don't, if, if my, I would stress this, if I, if my life depended on telling you it was on Wednesday at 7 o'clock in the evening on ABC, I'd be dead the next minute. Okay? I have no concept of what's actually on television and public broadcasting or private broadcasting at all. This is enough. Fighting for America is enough to keep me busy all by itself, trust me. And if you want to have a lot, if you want to be entertained, if you want to be educated, all you need to do is dig into the health of the nation and understand what it's about. The television is a propaganda mechanism. It should be shut off, and in fact, until such time as the general population does run it again, right now it's three small conglomerates. Oh, by the oops, that's right, they kicked one out, didn't they? Brought another one in, all because of football. It's four, but it'll be three. Okay, CBS is waning, isn't it? Well, those three conglomerates virtually control everything that you see, hear, and do with regard to television, with regard to knowledge. If they wish to be selective, delete, and modify things, we need only turn to Ted Turner and his most recent announcements. In fact, he got out of a Florida University paper. It's very interesting. The morphing of the screen. Everybody saw Terminator 2, didn't they? Remember Terminator 2 where you can make the critter do anything he wants? More recently, we've, we've seen a movie come out called The Crow. Is everybody familiar with it? Bruce, Bruce Lee's son just did it. Uh, he died during the filming of the movie. They released the movie, completed. Let me ask you something. How did they do that? Ah, thank you very much. What they did, they took all the images they had from the earlier filming, brought them all together by computer, and morphed in the rest of the movie with the character not even there and, in fact, dead. Now, people say, well, what, what would that have to do with reality? If you, <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with reality, does it? But if you can do that with the crow, with a movie, then it's just a matter of time where I, if I have criminals who are videotaped, well, even if you weren't a criminal, eventually we can make you a criminal. You'll note, for instance, an example, and they're getting people into the cycle of this. Well, first of all, from the one hand, American Gladiators. Who would have believed they'd ever come up with a title like that, nor would they have even introduced a program like that? Well, when you think about it, bread and circuses, old Rome, new, or old Rome and now old America, it was necessary to keep the people busy. Blood sports were very important. If you've ever read Iron Mountain, the proposal goes back to the 60s that they were actually going to be introducing something like that here. Well, could they really do it? Yes, I think they could. Wouldn't take much to take the foam pads off whatever toys they're playing and hack and chop on a few people. That might get boring after a while, so you throw in a patron every once in a while you've captured on the streets. Of course, he was guilty of some other crime, and he gets to use a short sword, and they get to have armor, and they get to hack and chop on him for 15 minutes, and you can all rate it, videotape it, eat popcorn, slug a few beers, and go home and sleep at night and get rid of the problem. 
Now, how would you create the criminal? Well, if you can morph a movie like The Crow, which was virtually millions of dollars, then it isn't that difficult for you to, with video courts, which you're all hearing about now, aren't you? Last week and the week before, Newsweek and uh, People and several others were talking about the glories and wonders of being so lazy you won't get up off your dead butts and go to the courtroom. They're going to bring the courtroom to you. And they're going to show evidence. They're going to demonstrate evidence. How would you even know that the evidence was real? Video? Excuse me? Look at some of the wonders that we already have. Now, imagine me, this face, in a variety of other scenarios, and you can, I guess, the, the imagination can do the rest. Needless to say, I don't think I'd be walking the streets for very long if they had their way. Now, that's just one perspective, and it's just one obvious action that's taking place. Well, Ted Turner, of course, has gone one step farther. He is going to completely recast original movies. He's going to go through all of the old archives and alter all of the old movies at his discretion. Humphrey Bogart won't be playing in Casablanca. And they can alter and politically make pol politically correct any of the movies that are there from the past so that they are properly engineered for their needs in the future. They're butt cold serious about this. Both Jane Fonda and Ted Turner, what a combination. <sighs> Hanoi Jane strikes again. Tom Hayden was no longer any good for her, and we know how Tom Hayden just lost his post, by the way. That's good. Unfortunately, Jane Fonda hasn't lost her life. That's perhaps to come. But unfortunately, uh, as politics is fickle, she's found a new friend, and Ted Turner is the man. Ted Turner dumped his wife with, uh, uh, I think, five children, and then apologized to the world for the fact that he'd had those five children, because, of course, now he's a global eco-freak. You know, eco uh, uh, do you realize what kind of an insult that'd be if I were his son or daughter? Dad, I'd come up and slap you silly. And I would. Because, uh, again, it's, re it's, it's interesting that uh, as he has acquired wealth, he, of course, has settled into the New World Order quite comfortably. We like to call C the uh, we like to call C-SPAN CFR span nowadays. Anybody watched it recently? About every day you get three CFR representatives. I, I challenge you to watch the bottom block of the screen when it says it gives the person's name and who they're representing. Now, there's a problem I have with that. It'd be one thing if you're talking to a government official, but you're not. Council on Foreign Relations sounds very impressive, doesn't it? You expect banners, marching parades, and things of that nature, and closed rooms, smoke-filled, lots of cigars, which they do have. But the Council on Foreign Relations is a private entity of internationalists whose primary mission is the destruction of the sovereignty of the United States, period. Nothing more, nothing less. One of their daughters, the Trilateral Commission, ooh, they use that commission thing again, gives it that air of power with lots of M's and duplicate letters. Well, the Trilateral Commission is nothing more than a private boys club doing the exact same thing. But you'll see them on, on CNN, you're going to see them even on ABC, NBC, and CBS on a regular basis now because they're in a mad dash to try and beat us. They're going to shove the New World Order down your throat one way or another, and in fact, most of it is, as they say, baffled with bull what? If you can't use fact, that's exactly what they're doing. It is futile to resist, you shall be absorbed. Everybody watches Star Trek, right? It's the Borg. You shall be absorbed, we shall get you all. Well, that's their concept, but a lot of us, like I said, have gotten away. Across the states, uh, the militia, in fact, is doing exceptionally well. And in fact, uh, I would say that uh, between the militia, the guard, the reserve, and active military components, that we are in a very good situation that we were not in two years ago. But we questioned, we felt we, felt we had good support. The nation as a whole is waking up, and the military has been our primary target to inform. Now, let me ask you something. Many of you here probably have brothers and sisters in the military, or aunts or uncles, or grandfathers, or mothers or fathers. How many of you have actually sent something to them and asked them about what is going on in the military? I have been to every state, and what I have found time and again where I've talked to people, and I've told them, go to your relatives, Give them a copy of anything that you've got. American Peril, Call to Arms, Vampire Killer 2000 is really good. Do you know how many times I've had people come back and say, Mark, I told my brother, and he, he first he started to cry, and he said, I didn't think anybody knew. I didn't think anybody cared. I couldn't believe what he said. He went on for two and three and four and five hours about what he'd been involved in and where he'd been and what he'd seen. Because for him it was unbelievable, but who does he turn to? 
See, this is part of the beauty of the New World Order and what it does. It isolates, separates, and segregates. Now, there's a lot of people here my age and older, and I know that because I get a pretty good view of the crowd from here. And you'll all remember what they did during the Vietnam War. And that was not accidental. Vietnam was a social engineering mechanism. It had nothing to do with the war itself. It had everything to do with separating elements of our society. And one of the most important was to isolate and separate the military from the people. Isn't it amazing how we've gone so far apart from what originally was? Because during when we founded this nation, the military and the people were one and the same. George Washington said uncategorically, a standing army is the free society. And one of the most important was to isolate and separate the military from the people. Isn't it amazing how we've gone so far apart from what originally was? Because during when we founded this nation, the military and the people were one and the same. George Washington said uncategorically, a standing army is the, free bane, is the bane of a free nation. He was absolutely right, and he was a professional soldier. Think about that. This is a man who had made a career in the military. He was a militia commander before the war. He had fought in the, French, in the, in the colonial wars against the Indians and against the uh, French. In fact, he had some very major defeats during those actions. And even though he knew full well what he'd faced during the American Revolution, he warned the American people of what a professional military force would do. And the fact that it's not that they're evil incarnate by themselves, but that eventually tyranny would prevail in any nation. That because of the nature of men and because of greed and avarice and arrogance, people would rise to the top that would use that force. Well, congratulations, the New World Order understood this before they got started. But what they had to do is drive more and more of the people into separate little pockets. The army and the military forces being the best example. Now, ladies, this is no offense, but why do you think they let women into the military? You ever thought about that, really? Well, demoralize, but also isolate and segregate. I'm not, I, I know many men and women who are married out of the military, but doesn't that close that, that and isolate that group? They marry within their own, they associate within their own, and they do not work with the population as a whole. With the CIA, with the Secret Service, they do the same thing. You can associate only with people in the company. By associating only with people in the company, no strange thoughts about that freedom thing get involved with the whole mechanism. You see how that works? They've been doing this for years with many groups. The sad part is, I've, um, and I have this from personal experience with a, with a friend of mine, that, uh, in fact, I got into the business. And that's exactly what happened. He was not to associate. He's in computer programming. He was not to associate with anybody outside the intelligence field. Sure enough, a few years later, since he's only allowed to associate in the field, who does he marry? Another woman who's another intelligence analyst. What does that tell you? Keep it closed. Keep it tight. Keep it simple. They're both on the leash. There's no way that they're going to separate from the mainstream. So they've isolated us. Have they isolated us in other ways? Well, let's take a look at the states. And then let's take a look at regionalism. We've got a copy of the New States of America Constitution, by the way, back there. We put some out that we didn't see earlier. I've got to congratulate the people who put this together because this particular document is priceless. If you want to know where we're going and why it is they're doing what they're doing, understand that even Henry Kissinger stated that, gentlemen, the founding fathers have written the Constitution too well. They would have to go around it or subvert it. They couldn't go through it. Well, that's, pretty, that's, that's quite a compliment for men 200 years dead. Think about that, because that is an amazing feat in itself. They understood human nature. People have told me before, oh, things have changed dramatically in the United States. Oh, really, have they? The difference between that electricity and the lamp isn't much. Certainly, you got rid of the horses, but you still have the horsepower in the car. We got a little bit more carpet, got a little fancier paint. But what has changed about human nature and people in general? Nothing. That doesn't mean the social engineers wouldn't like to take a lot away from us <laughs> if they had their way. In fact, they'd prefer drones. Drones are much more desirable and eventually get rid of us in favor, I'm sure, of something even more uh, uh, auto autonomous like a, or I should say auto automated, like a robot, or at least an organic robot. Well, obviously we're not. And with the... New States of America Constitution, now something that was uh, brought forward as a reality back in 1976, not 1986, not in the 1990s. This thing's been around for 20 years. They're only two states away from winning a victory. 
Right now, CONCON is proposed in five different states of the union. Ohio is halfway through, but we've stalled it temporarily. It went through the Senate and passed. If Ohio falls, they need but one more state, and this union, as far as the Constitution is concerned, is dissolved. Most people have not even perceived the threat because, again, we have so many things to be busied with that most people don't even know it's happening. That's right, bread and circuses, sports, etc. And also just life in general. And I don't think anybody here is wealthier than they were 10 years ago. Maybe a few of you are, thank goodness. But most of us are fighting harder to get less and to make less. I've been all through the South. I know exactly what the economy is like across the country because I get to deal with it firsthand talking to the people who are running it. Parts of Mississippi and Alabama I went through two and three years ago are ghost towns today. You go through the east, it's the same way. Shops closed, businesses closed, factories closed. Where'd those factories go? When you're in Michigan, outside, they shipped them out of the country. Where did they go? Probably Japan, Indonesia, Micronesia. You're seeing them in Korea, again, where this little flare spot is. And what they're doing is they're destroying our industrial base. They're they understand exactly the long-term effects of that also. With the new States of America Constitution, for instance, it abolishes the 50 states and gives us the 10 regional governments. You've heard of that before probably from different thing, works that we've done. But almost everything that's involved in the new States of America Constitution is privilege. In other words, at the discretion of the government, you have a right. In fact, it's not even a right. It is simply listed as a privilege. At the discretion of the government, you shall have some form of religion. And if they don't like it, they will take it away. The right to jury trial, the last check and balance that's still working right now, is also a privilege which is granted by the judge and decided by the judge, not by the defendant. Now think about that. We have seen several cases the likes of which the only reason the defendant survived is because even though the jury was manipulated, they could not hide the fact that they were trying to feed them, excuse me, a shit pie. They could put sugar on it, but it's still a shit pie. And with regard to it, as we saw with the Waco case, they set the jury, they limited the media to four people. You saw none of the trial covered on national news or even on local news. Why? Because even when they tried to totally control and fabricate everything, the 12 jurists that were there still could not have the wool pulled over their eyes that easily. And they could see and they could imagine themselves sitting in the defense seat waiting to be fried. Even though we are way down the road and many people are ill-educated in how our government works, they still remember a few words like our founding fathers, gentlemen, if we do not hang together, we most assuredly shall hang separately. And so sitting in the, sitting in the juror's box, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's literally it, sitting in the juror's box, if I get those S's right, it's very easy to imagine your daughter, your son, your grandfather sitting on the other side waiting for some judgment to be levied against them. And again, justice prevailed, but it won't for long. The enemy already is deep inside the heart of the nation in many areas. From education, which if they have their way, this Global 2000 project, and many of the women here might be familiar with it, many of the parents here might be familiar with it, Global 2000 and tracking will take away from your children the right and option that you had to choose a career. Think about that. This is right out of Orwell. By tracking with the Global 2000 program and lumping your children in particular groups and directing them without any options, they might not be able to have that job or they might not be able to acquire a job that is well paying or capable of supporting them. In fact, they'll require more and more support from the state, from the Fed, etc. Also, the option simply by the fact that through, through, through our opportunities with, with the freedom that we have, they are capable of choosing a lifestyle that they want. If they want to be a machinist, they can be a machinist. I've done a little bit of everything, and I've had a great time doing it, and I've done well. If I don't like it, I walked away from it. With the New World Order, that won't happen. You won't have that choice. If tomorrow you want to try and be a lawyer, you can be a lawyer, or a policeman, or a doctor, or whatever. Granted, you might fall flat on your face. Congratulations, that's part of the mysteries of freedom. It's called responsibility and, and opportunity. If you fail, you fail of your own volition. But at least you may, you're given the opportunity and you have the capability to do so. That will all change and will all fade away into history. In fact, trust me on this, it will never have taken place with the New World Order. 
For all that we're doing now, even all that I am saying, will never have taken place. It can be changed. If you have but one side, and I've listened to people tell me all about the glories of the New World Order, if you have but one side, who do you negotiate with and why should they negotiate? One government, one military, one regime, one mechanism, one, as they have said, and I always use their words, one iron fist is their machine. The iron fist. I've heard this a dozen times in England. We've heard this even out west from the governor of Colorado. They shall rule with the iron fist. We've heard them right here in Michigan, where we're from. I've seen it and had it on documentation and papers where they've talked about the fact that the MJTF police would be the velvet glove on the iron fist. Anybody ever get hit with an iron fist? Velvet glove make any difference? Still, still slaps you silly, doesn't it? Still leaves a scar. Well, they understand that also. They're very important. It's very important that they use the velvet whenever possible. As I said before, sugar on the shit pie. By doing this and creating this illusion, they can get you to take a bite, but they may not get you to swallow. Okay? We already know what we've got and what's in store for us. We understand what this program is all about. So we say with very simple terms, no. Ever tried using that word? It's been a while since you have probably. No. We will not accept the new world order. No. You shall not have my children. No. The weapons that I possess are mine. And the reason I have them is because that is coercive force. If it is good enough for the government, it most assuredly is good enough for all of you to have. <laughs> Interesting point there. Who's the government? We the people. We. Now let me ask you something. Anybody see here a few weeks ago a very interesting piece, which was we all saw it on, on the news, it was like Good Morning America, talking about those fanatics that are running all over the country. Did anybody see that, where they had these little books? You know what little book they were talking about? Pocket constitutions. Those fanatics with the pocket constitutions that say, we the people. Well, most people are ignorant nowadays and they haven't read the Constitution so long, they don't even know what, it start, what any of our documents start with, so they wouldn't have recognized it. Thank you. Could I borrow that, please? The reason I have to is because I keep giving mine away. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. This is one of the books that they were showing, Little Pocket Constitution. And heaven forbid every American should have this in his pocket. And as, as, our, as our lady here said, don't leave home without it. We don't. Well, the Constitution, interestingly enough, has to be attacked because, as Kissinger said, it was written too well. But what they stressed is that you'll find these people all over the nation, and they're using this thing. Well, yes, we've always used this thing. But if you're going to come up with this rag here and try and overshadow it, most assuredly you have to ridicule it. And didn't Washington, and didn't Jefferson, and didn't Franklin, and didn't every, every one of the founding fathers tell us this would happen? Then in our own ignorance, you know, when they asked, uh, what type of government have you given us? And they said, oh, a republic, if you can keep it. So now this generation gets to decide whether or not they can keep this. When we are done and we win, we will. This young man right here and some of the other youths that I see in the audience today get to decide in their generation whether or not they shall keep it. For I guarantee you that in the war to come, and it will be a war, I will not hedge on this one, that in the war to come after we are victorious, that it will come again, that the wave shall face us once again, that they'll be back again because they hate us with a passion. Tyrants and slaves hate free men because misery loves company. That's why. If I can stand and say what I'm saying right now, I am a great threat to the regime. The worst part about it is this, I'm not the only one doing it. And that's why they're not sure how to respond yet. They haven't, been, they haven't been used to this for a long time. Americans in general from all parts of the nation are standing up to and demanding that the government follow this. And this is their signpost. This is their guideline. They should have no other. 
I got into this, uh, the interesting uh, twist, uh, twisted debate that's usually used is, well, treaties are the same as laws. Treaties are the same, same as laws, so the UN has the same authority over us as the Constitution. Wrong. When the Constitution came about, does everybody remember there were two votes, weren't there? The first one formed the basic Constitution. When it went out to the states and to all the representatives, what did they say? Take it back, for it does not have the protection that is necessary to chain government, to ensure that government does not become an enemy of the people. And so when they came back, they came back with what? The Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights stated uncategorically that all other actions are restricted by that first, that the Constitution is the binding word. If a treaty is in violation of this document and the other guiding documents, it is null and void. That is my signpost. This is my guiding light. It gets into a little point here, too. I notice I hand it right. I can stand it right here. You know how they match so well? You ever notice that? You know why? You ever notice how years ago here they, they decided to rule that you could burn the flag? Do you know why they let you burn the flag? Why they re agreed to it? It had nothing to do with freedom of, freedom of uh, activities, freedom of expression. The flag behind me is a good flag. It doesn't have the gold fringe. This is a constitutional flag. Do we have a, a king or a queen in this country? Do we have a monarch? Do we have a dictatorship? Well, we do now. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I should have worded that differently, yes. Yes, there's a dictatorship, but it's not our government, okay? When they agreed to let you burn this, the reason they let you burn it is because that wasn't their flag you were burning. In fact, what you're doing when you're burning the American flag is slapping yourself in the face silly because that flag represents this Constitution. That is the only physical representation we have. You can take the president tomorrow if you want to, but don't do anything to this flag. This is my document. This is the only physical representation we have of this in the field. And that's why they laughed all the way back from the courtroom into their private chambers. Because when you burn that flag, you're only hurting yourself. Now, if you want to hurt somebody, if you want to do damage to the other side, do what they always used to do. Find an effigy of the enemy put him up on a pole and burn him. Okay, you'll find you go to court right away though. Why? Because it's the same as threatening the king. Oh, I'm sorry, the same as, as uh, yeah, threatening the king. Oops, I'm right. That's why, that's what this is all about. Now, if you burn the right flag, which we did find out something about too, a white field with three red stripes underneath it and three stars over top of it that are red. If you can find one of those, that is the flag that you should burn because that is the representation of the central regime and it is a flag that is hardly ever seen. If you take that flag out and burn it, I guarantee you will be put in jail because you will be burning the proper effigy and you'll be destroying the proper, the proper symbol of the enemy. But this is yours, not to be destroyed but to be cherished, just as this is yours, not to be destroyed but be held on to even with your last dying gasp to ensure that we can hand it on to these kids. Everybody knows about that. At least you do now. The Constitution was, of course, a document that required a great deal of teething. I think everybody will recall that the Founding Fathers, when they came together, many were ministers. And I notice we've tried to take this more and more away from the people, and in fact, the, federal, the, the regime is incredibly fearful of the fact that we might actually find God again. But the best example of it is the fact that when they were striving to try and come up with a solution called the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Founding Fathers would fast and pray for days. As they became more embroiled in government during the Revolution, especially in the first two years, they actually got away from that. And in our darkest hour, as, as Washington was fighting his rear guard action across the nation, literally, Several of the members stood up and reminded them that, gentlemen, we have been amiss, for we have forgotten whose authority we are granted and by whose authority this nation exists. And so they prayed and they fasted again. And, of course, we all know the outcome. But they had to go back to their roots. They forgot in the flurry of government who it is and whose authority they were mustering under. Now, they worked it out, needless to say. And don't, you can't say that we didn't have some contention afterwards with regard to certain points and that we haven't lost some things with regard to the Constitution. The states' rights issue is still an issue today. It is in, the, it is in its later stages. Uh, arguments, example, are regarding the militia of the state. 
Most recently, several governments argued, several state governments argued against sending troops to Desert Storm on the grounds that the National Guard belonged to who? The state. The Fed demonstrated, you, demonstrated to you their wiles and their manipulation in that they stated, no, we provided you with the weapons, we provided you with the equipment, those soldiers are ours. Well, most assuredly, what that was a demonstration of the flexing of the muscles of the New World Order and how they have wheedled their way in all the way down to state level. That's why we need the state's militia. That's why we need the militia at large, which you are all members of, by the way. The militia at large cannot be projected overseas. Its mission is to protect and defend the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, to protect your homes, to protect your freedom and your family. It can be made up of any and all individuals who are available at a moment's notice. That is, it's important that you take on that responsibility. That is why they have gone after the weapons though also, because if you perceive and realize this, you all understand, this is your first liberty tooth, this. And the second are the weapons that you, you possess to back it up. Now getting into the gun issue here, let me ask you something. When was the last time you saw two street gangs or drug gangs bayonet charge each other? <laughs> wasn't in yesterday's news? It wasn't, was it? Well, it's important to remember that, and in fact, we've got this in several, several field manuals that were to be destroyed before anybody was to see them. In fact, they were very limited print. And all they did was validate what we've been arguing for the last couple of months, and several months actually, that the reason the gun laws are being written the way they are is to destroy our capability to formulate a militia as it properly should be organized. Why did they go after bayonet lugs in this latest restriction, along with many other military features? Well, as is stated in the one manual, if the force that you are facing does not have a martial arm, in other words, a weapon with martial features, bayonet lug, flash hider, magazine, etc., if they do not possess a uniform, if they do not have insignia, and if they do not have an order or command structure, you can do, and I'm using their words, you can do anything to them you wish. Because you are not subject to the protections of the laws of nations, and because, of course, the, Gen the Geneva and Hague treaties do not apply. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to follow those all the time. But your enemy is very concerned about the color of law. And remember also, they have to twist the honor of the soldiers that originally swore to protect our Constitution. The way to do that is to alter in their minds and make it justifiable to do what they are going to do. See how that works? So that's why you do need a bayonet lug on the rifle. You do need a flash hider. You should have them. And any time it's challenged, it could be taken to court and has been taken to court successfully defending your militia rights. The anti-gun people have come up with this several times. Well, there's no reason for having a gun. It's a people killer. You're right, exactly. It is a people killer. Thank you. They kind of go stupid then because there's no other argument. Yes, it's a people killer. <laughs> It's why firearms became a health care problem uh, this last time around with the medical bill. Because firearms are definitely a health problem for tyrants. <laughs> and so for that reason, of course, they've targeted them. And we may actually see one of the most uh, devastating, deep, and all-encompassing actions to, first of all, take your magazines, take your weapons. You already know what's happening with your ammunition. And if at all possible, strip as much of it away from the people as they can. Example, arbitrary enforcement, real quick. Anybody notice how you're supposed to, if they pass this law, have your magazines for all of your weapons serial numbered? And you have to prove that you bought them before the ban. Now, has anybody ever been pulled over in a car along the road and tried to prove at 3 in the morning or 4 in the morning or 2 in the afternoon that something they purchased was purchased 2 or 3 or 4 years ago or 6 years ago? Ever try it? So what do you think is going to happen? Arbitrary enforcement will be picked up and carried away. Now, in California, if they do that, for instance, and many of your states may already have this and you just don't know it, because of the new laws in California, if they confiscated your weapon, even if it wasn't a banned weapon, they do not return the weapon to the owner. Ah, cha-ching. That's how they take more weapons out of circulation. And they penalize you even if you're not guilty. So they would do this with magazines, ammunition, spare parts, equipment, etc. 
You might note that Clinton said just a few days ago, actually I think it was six, seven days ago, that he would like to see a ban on camouflage uniforms, equipment, and materiel. This is to be expected because what did I list here? Martial arms, uniform, rank, and a pecking order. By banning the uniforms, you are then what? Well, we used to call them brigands, pirates, terrorists is the new term, but that's what they're going to go with. And of course, you will all be, that key phrase, criminals. How many times you heard them say, oh, we're not interested in the law buying firearms owner. We're only interested in criminals. And everybody goes, oh, they're not talking about me. Well, the problem is they, they are talking about you. You're just not using the right dictionary. Remember, when talking to the enemy, always use the same vocabulary. He's not lying. He's using the Cheshire Cat Syndrome. You know, oh, yes, I'm only interested in criminals. <laughs> and you are one, too, with regard to everything. Firearms in general, of course, if they have their way, will be banned. Hand control handgun Control Incorporated has printed a vast amount of information that was leaked out about their 10-year agenda, which is not a 10-year agenda, I think, but a two-year or three-year agenda. This includes, of course, the banning of hunting. Four people getting together to hunt is considered to be a, an illegal crowd. Camouflage, of course, would be illegal. Toy guns would be illegal. Civil War reenactments would be illegal. Revolutionary War reenactments would be illegal. And we've already seen a reflection of this, by the way, in Michigan. How many people here have heard of the, uh, the um, uh, Henry Ford Museum? Okay, that's in Michigan. It's fairly famous. Every year we used to have Civil War reenactments with live, you know, blank fire. Well, that's not politically correct now. And so, of course, over the last two years, they've been phasing not only reenactments out, but now they don't even want the Civil War reenactors there themselves encamped. And they don't want the revolutionary soldiers there encamped either because that doesn't project the proper image they want for the New World Order's image of the past. That we didn't have the arms, that we didn't have the capabilities, that we didn't have the equipment. You see, all that will cease to exist. You can rewrite history and gradually phase it out. If history is not pre preserved by the historians, who will preserve it? Ah. And that from a museum. And this policy is taking place all over the country. We've heard about it in the South. We've heard about it out West. So it's happening in many places. It is part of our culture. As I said before, the American people are some of the most generous people on the planet. But if you piss us off, we are your worst nightmare, and we will come and eat your lunch. And that's a fact. Many people have found out the hard way. Right now, I guess I could turn my attention to a little, a little subject there that is kind of a twist of, uh, twist of history uh, against us. We went into Iran, of course, I'm sorry, Iraq, to take out Saddam Hussein and free the Iraqi people. Didn't know, that's right, we didn't free the Iraqi people. Uh, to free the oil for the oil conglomerates, yeah, that's basically what we did. We spent a vast amount of money. We spent a vast amount of resources and time. And when we were done, yeah, we did get Kuwait back. Well, we could have got Kuwait back anytime we wanted. But we didn't finish the job. After having created the condition, they could not allow 400,000 English-speaking, English-reading American soldiers to walk into a country where there were so many documents written in English that came from the United States on how to build nukes that they could not afford to see those soldiers walk in. Because you know what my boys did? They did this. And that's what every American soldier has done in every war we've ever been in. Trust me, I've seen stuff that was carried back from World War II and World War I. The kitchen sink, Hitler's silverware, flags, bayonets, bathtubs, boats, anything you get their hands on walks back with us. Can you imagine trying to hide the fact that that whole war was fabricated when you have 400 of the 400,000 of the best educated soldiers we've ever put in the field in that country? I don't think so. And that's why we had to stop at the border there. Well, I touched on it a little earlier, but Korea is becoming the same situation. Korea, as part of the international issue, is very important to understand. Why? Because the New World Order has now come full circle. <laughs> Challenge you to think about this. East and West Germany, do they exist now? They're gone, aren't they? The wall's down. North and South Vietnam was the first of the Cold War experiences, long gone. Czechoslovakia, does it still exist? Very quietly in the back pages of your newspaper, a little article this big, you probably saw it, about that wide, about Czechoslovakia agreeing to separate. And they did. And it didn't even get any big headlines, and they didn't finally talk about it in Newsweek or Time until months after it happened. Why? They didn't want you to think about it. That's a card waiting to be played. But isn't Czechoslovakia important? 
I would think it is. I'm an historian. I'm, in fact, uh, I've been a student of history for a long time. And what fascinates me is Czechoslovakia is one of the reasons we've, we got World War II. That was one of the excuses for fighting World War II. I'd say that's pretty significant that that country should be split asunder. Let's go a little farther south. Yugoslavia, does it exist now? No. But what is it now? It's a series of four or five little nations. Macedonia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Serbia, Croatia. Okay? The one oddball card I couldn't understand was Yemen, north and south, because I said, well, that's really strange. They let that, that, that sit. Strangely enough, what happened at the beginning of this last week? North and south Yemen are now at war. They've been fighting a border skirmish for the last several, for several days. And they are starting to become very serious. Now, north and south Yemen have frog sevens, light, uh, they're tactical uh, nuclear delivery systems, but they're probably not nuked. They can still do a lot of damage, and they're going to shoot the snot out of each other. Well, what does this all do? I want you to pull out a map from 1914, prior to World War II, and I want you to compare it to the map that they have recreated in 1994. And you want to shudder when you take a look at it. You're going to realize what you have is the entire monar monarchical Europe completely reestablished and rebordered as it was in 1914. Shades of World War I. To a T, they have done this. You need only look at maps that perhaps may have been purged from some of your libraries, but you can find on your own bookshelves. So why Korea? Korea is the piece de resistance, the final phase in which they will symbolically take the American sovereignty from us, if they can, if we're stupid enough to give it away, and also close the chapter called the Cold War, which was fabricated with the very place they started, coming full circle from very beginning to very end. The Korean War never ended, by the way. It has always been fought. It is still being fought on the DMZ. Some men here may have been there at one time or another. Every year we lose 44 to 59 men to combat losses on the DMZ that are written off in other ways. We have men come back in parts and pieces because they've been, they've been involved in activities. The Koreans are very aggressive and very nationalistic and very proud of their position, and rightly so. Well, now... They have to make a decision whether or not to use this card because, again, because of these awakenings, all the way across on the other side of the globe, they have to keep the American people busy. Do you see this? Do you see this? Oops. Weren't paying attention, were you? And so by keeping us busy in Korea, burning up our military resources, sending our people overseas to a war that isn't necessary, they are going to create the conditions to consolidate the new world order and one flag, the UN flag, as a sovereign flag over all the military forces that fight in the peninsula. Ah, and can they do it? Yes, they can, because the first thing is going to be told to everybody, well, aren't you patriotic? Aren't you supporting our boys? I support my soldiers 100%. I trained a lot of them. But I'm also not stupid. I wouldn't send them off on frivolous or ignorant activities like this, knowing full well that they're fabricated, that they're manipulating us. We have to challenge that. We have to tell them, no. Again, learn that word, no. Where can the Koreans go? I ask you, where's North Korea going to go? China? Excuse me? Let's watch this one and sit and laugh, laugh from a distance. China would deal with them in a heartbeat, wouldn't they? Yeah. South Korea? Trust me, they want to fight just as badly as the North does. I've seen them. Japan? Japan is, is begging for the, the capability to become nuclear. And if you'll notice, the big threat right now is that they're going to dump eggs on Japan. Eggs on Japan. Shouldn't we give Japan the same capability? Uh-oh. And now we go full circle to another old enemy who has never been defeated in 3,000 years, Japan. Japan's history is a legacy of victory upon victory upon victory and never having, having seen its soil sullied by foreign invaders until some of the people in this room showed up in 1944 and 45. Do you think that after 3,000 years of written history that they would forget the fact that we came town ate their lunch? I don't think so. I wouldn't. So with that in mind, what are the mechanizations of the Korean, uh, Korean activities? Well, first of all, and I'll remind you this because I listened to this on television before I came up to this podium, and, I, and it, again, it just sinks in very quickly. They don't care which side wins. And if you don't think so, you better go right back to Iraq and look at who's in power still in Iraq. Saddam Hussein is right where he was before he invaded Kuwait. 
If tomorrow the Korean War began and North Korea, with the help of China, won, we would be buying from North Korea, which would then become all of Korea, anything they would make within probably a week. The New World Order cares not who wins in this engagement, but rather whether or not Korea becomes a consolidated country as one and a conduit for economic resource in the region to become the next global threat against us. This will create the, the conduit that's needed to bond Japan and China together because that's been a very big problem. Koreans do not necessarily like the Japanese for obvious reasons. They've been occupied for 50 plus years at a time and more. Major military actions have been fought for decades in the Korean Peninsula over the last thousand years. It has also been, as I said before, the conduit for trade and commerce to bridge the gap between the two nations at many, at many different times. And so a whole Korea means that the dragon called Asia becomes whole with one of its little dragons coming to power, Central Korea. What other damage would it do? Well, in order for you to be successful at implementing things like this garbage here, this toilet paper called the New States of America Constitution, <coughs> you have to keep the American people busy overseas. Shakespeare used it and said it well. Busy, giddy minds with foreign wars and you can do anything you wish at home. How many times during the D-Day mem uh, uh, memorial that we had Bill Clinton, a man who was a coward during the Vietnam War and would have been a coward during World War II also, by the way, Think about it. If he'd been around in World War II, he'd have gone to Moscow or any place else he could have found and would have been in Oxford. Well, wait a minute, Oxford's being bombed. He'd have gone someplace deeper in the country probably or Canada. He's there, of course, honoring our soldiers. And he made a comment that was really bizarre. He said, because of you Americans, the American fighting man of World War II, communism was defeated. Eh? <laughs> Excuse me? Wait a minute. Hello. Hello. Jafar. Hello. Don't you kind of wonder about that? Of course, that's playing on the fact that most people don't know history anymore. Who were we fighting in World War II? The Germans and the Japanese, okay? We weren't fighting the Russians. But on the other hand, what you're trying to do is get that generation to fall in lockstep with the New World Order by petting them on the head and giving them a little pretzel. Most of you may not have heard of the little comment that was made by, or the, not comment, but action that took place, I believe it was in Italy. I have to check it. We still haven't got the full, uh, the, the full piece on it. The veterans that were on the podium with Clinton stood up and pushed him and his entire Secret Service element off the stage and out of the room. Yes. We didn't see that on prime time tonight, did we? But they were veterans with, with the same kind of gumption they had when they went to Anzio and D-Day. You'll notice every time they spoke this last week, the international effort, the international this, the international that. And of course, the American people has sacrificed at D-Day. And it really, it was bad, but it was a nice historical event. Wouldn't you want to be remembering a historical event 50 years and help invade Korea? You and the other young men that are here, don't you want to remember, remember it on television later on down the road? That is if they remembered, of course. The whole idea was to create this air of, gee, I, I want to be part of that. Oh, it's like the Iraqi war. You know, during the Iraqi war, did you see any bodies? That was a pretty clean war. I'd like to go to a war like that. Didn't see any bodies, no blood, no guts, just lots of burned out vehicles. That makes it almost fun to go to war again. Then turn the tables when they want to try and get people involved in something and we're not involved yet, Yugoslavia. Three obligatory body pictures every week in People, in Time, in Newsweek. You've got to tug at your heartstrings. You got to spend money there. You got to send your sons and daughters there. Isn't it amazing how the propaganda shifts depending upon the need? Well, D-Day, the international event, for instance, one of the most fascinating pictures I saw was a picture of a Canadian maple leaf with four prongs as if the Canadians had landed at all four beaches and there was no other symbol, just the Canadian maple leaf, like the Canadians were the only ones who invaded on D-Day. Which made me wonder, they only lost 300 people. What happened to all those other guys, okay? Well, this is visions of things to come. First of all, lack of history, lack of knowledge, and definitely the use of, pro of past events to try and motivate the people in a specific way. I had people tell me two and three years ago in college, I worked at U of M, in school that, oh, the American people could never be fooled by something like this. We're too smart for them nowadays, okay? I'll go right back to what they did when they invaded Kuwait. 
what was the most important issue on the news, newspaper headlines for three days why they invaded Kuwait. Anybody remember? Zsa Zsa Gabor slaps a cop. That was breaking headline news. It was on every nightly news service for three days straight. And there was this little blurb about some military thing going on in Kuwait right now. Now, you weigh that out and tell me which one's more important. I'll give you examples of, of other ones like that, like when the kids were lost, that's another one. What about the Bobbitt story? Everybody knows that name. I don't have to explain it, do I? Okay. But was that earth-shattering national news? It was nothing. It was a local event. It has happened in other places, but they needed something like that to keep people busy being very myopic. Concentrate on this dot and don't worry about the rest of the room. You see? That's right. Bread and circuses. Keep people busy. Don't watch this hand. Watch this hand. Oops, I've got you by the short hairs. Well, that's exactly... Oop, pardon the pun there. Anyway... Anyway, we also had in Michigan, of course, another example of that. The infamous steel rod incident, remember, with our national skaters in the Olympics. What was happening while that was taking place? Thank you very much. Anything to fill the pages and keep people busy so they would not pay attention to reality. And we're right there in Detroit, and it was still like we were turning away from that thing as quickly as it happened. And starting to, what was going, as soon as that happened, I had to do this. I, I'm sorry, I'm very skeptical. Whenever I see something as frivolous as that, I start looking around to see where the bullets are going to start flying from because you know that something's in the wind. Like I, like I told some of the young soldiers that unfortunately went over to Desert Storm, uh, I said, you know what? The louder they scream, peace, the sooner you better grab your hind end and dig a deeper hole. Because as I said with Kuwait, was probably the best example, just as they did that, we knew there was a major war coming because they said it was the end of history. No more significant events were going to take place. You notice how that disappeared from the headlines? They don't talk about that now. Where everything was going to float off into some warm, fuzzy tomorrow with nothing taking place, nothing happened to be too exciting. Needless to say, we know things have been very exciting ever since. There have been a series or a plethora of wars they've developed, and in fact, they have three cards to play on right now with external activities. One, Korea. Two, Yugoslavia, which has been set up quite well for us. Three, the African campaign somewhere in South or Central Africa. Rwanda was a warning to all of you. It had nothing to do with, with uh, the government per se. The New World Order had orchestrated and set up the situation, and it's for you to see on television every night, again, buckets of bodies. Now, on the other hand, when they wanted you to get into something, they didn't show you jack, as far as that goes. Like I said, sterile trucks, the death highway. Everybody saw those pictures of the death highway in Iraq, didn't they? Maybe one body was still left in the truck because the truck was probably burning when they came through to bury everybody that was there. But they made sure that that was a clean kill on television. On the other hand, when they needed to manipulate people now, of course, and we want you guys to all settle back in your chairs. Don't get uppity. Whatever you do, don't get uppity. We're going to show you stacks of bodies the way they have in Rwanda or in Croatia or Bosnia. Another thing about that with Yugoslavia, should we be involved in providing arms for any side there? No. Why? Well, let's go right back to 18, the 1870s. A gentleman by the name of Bismarck, very adept at war, having fought three Franco-Prussian wars and kicking the snot out of the French, taking Alsace-Lorraine and hanging on to it for a period of time. He was also involved in many other global campaigns. When asked about the Balkans, which is the Yugoslavia that we know today, he stated with regard to sending his troops not all of the Balkans are worth the healthy bones of one Pomeranian musketeer. In other words, stay away. They won't necessarily win right away, but they will keep eating your lunch until there's no tomorrow. They'll pick you here, stab you there, find you wherever they have to, and like the Americans, they are hard to forget. They will keep fighting and fighting and fighting. And Bismarck was there. He didn't have to worry about planes. He didn't have to worry about trains. He didn't have to worry about ships. He was on the continent, sitting next to Yugoslavia, where he could walk in. And he would not. He was a good student of history, and he understood the people he was dealing with and the ethnic picture overall. Do we also have any business telling these people what to do? Well. Personally, I found that every time the United Nations gets involved, whoever it is that they have us side with usually would have been our enemy, and the other side would have been our friends. 
As is typically the case, any time somebody has tried to promote our form of government, a constitutional republic, you will find, as I think probably the best example was Katanga during the 60s. The, Kat the Katangese government seceded from the central Congo when the communists started to take over. Katanga was a very successful operation. They had their own agriculture, mining, rail service. They got along well. It was a wide spectrum of people that lived in that nation. Immediately, the United Nations turned its eyes upon Katanga and ignored the rest of the Congo debacle for a few years. Implementing virtual, virtual martial law and progressively invading the country, it no longer exists. There's an excellent tape called Katanga that I challenge everybody to watch to see what they are doing here and how they did it before. And again, the tape unfortunately was designed to try and get, gain aid for Katanga. It failed because unfortunately, even as they did it, the country fell. Now Africa's in the same boat again right now. We have two or three different factions in South Africa. Most assuredly, the communists have just taken over. I am oft fascinated by the, propaganda, the propagandists when they crop photos or when they make things disappear. Probably the best example is a picture of Nelson Mandela standing with the party symbol behind him, which was erased in all American publications, but in Canadian publications was left intact showing the hammer and sickle behind his head right here. He is a card-holding Communist Party member. Now the Zulus, on the other hand, which are now still a power faction, a power group inside the country, are predominantly Christian. Christian population groups in southern and central Africa have not fared well, and Katanga was the best example. They had a large inter-religious uh, group, Muslim, uh, Christian, and in fact even Jewish, and they fought quite well together against a common enemy, the United Nations, when the time came because they understood that if they lost the nation, they'd lose their lives, and they did. South Africa is probably moving towards a similar situation, but unfortunately, they're going to try and get us involved there also. And obviously, the military actions are moving in that direction to keep that as an alternate card. Now, what's important about South Africa? Does anybody realize it? What's the most important issue with South Africa? Not gold, not diamonds. 65% of the nuclear material that is used by all nations comes out of South Africa for reactor service. 65% of the mineable, fissionable material that can be used. That by itself makes that nation a priceless gem. And who is instrumental in this? England. The country keeps cropping up everywhere we've had problems. England would be able to reacquire a wealth that it lost because it lost its colonial frontiers. It is now putting its finger back in the pie through the United Nations and as with Rhodesia, which became Zimbabwe, as with the Congo when it fell from Belgium, etc., they are implementing the same actions to turn the country into rubble and buy the product for little of nothing, which is what will happen. They'll get it for nothing. The people who rightfully own it will not receive anything for it when they're done. And their bleached bones will sit on the, on the savanna for years to come. This is, a, this is obviously going to take place. It will happen. Now, what can we do to stop this? Because everybody always says, Mark, you're always telling all about gloom and doom, but what do you do? Okay, what do we do? Well, on the international picture, there's very little that we can actually do to stop them completely. But that simple word, no, needs to be used more often by the people as a whole. Even now, they're trying to pull all the stops out with a propaganda machine to pull us into a war somewhere. Why do they need the war? They'll use a one, two, three punch on the United States to knock us down. An external conflict would tie up most of our regular military force. An internal conflict combined with an economic crisis would be ideal. How many people know we've been talking about the money change for years, haven't we? How many people have seen in the last week and two weeks extensive articles done by many of the major publications on the new money change coming? Why the money change? Well, as was talked about with the IRS here in the very beginning, and they are one of the linchpins of the New World Order, the illegal income tax, which is in violation of the Constitution and is one of the planks of the Communist Manifesto, one of the ten planks of the Communist Manifesto. The income tax was designed to drain resources out of the country. This is a battle for free resource. Many people have told me before, well, they can't do it to us because there are so many of us. They may not be able to do it to us right away, and they knew they couldn't immediately when they originally perpetrated all of this. 
But what they could do is beat us down progressively to a point where we were easier to deal with. Example, how many people here bought ammunition a year ago? $60 a case for 30 caliber Russian, wasn't it? What's a case of 30 caliber Russian ammo right now? It's up to $600. On the East Coast, it's up to seven right now. As little as 380 to 400 where we are. Now, can you go to the bank and invest money and make that kind of profit? Oh, thank you very much. You can't, can you? In fact, you'd love to be able to walk in with paper and make a, an inter a profit like that on a regular basis. That's not the case here, though. Because unfortunately, if I sell it, I won't have it. If I don't have it, I might need it. So how can I afford to give it away? <laughs> I can't sell it. But I could for, uh, compensate for all the money I've spent if I bought five or six cases by selling only one case now. What they have done is they've created an economic imbalance here now. If you were trying to arm in the past, you could have bought five or six times what you need to purchase, what you need to have to purchase one case now. What is that a challenge? That's a challenge to the free resources that you had available at the time and have now. Now, that money that you could have spent before is going to have to be spent on one product instead of several. Instead of having the capability to buy not just ammunition, but to buy weapons, food, and equipment, you're now going to have to target more of your free resources into a limited channel, just to make sure you have what you need. This is how the enemy has worked for years. In fact, that's really how they attacked our economy. Right now, if they were to go with the money change under the original scheme, which was part of PL 100-690, which we've talked about before, and all it does is draw you a map. Thank you. Oh, it draws you a map. I'll be worry about this now. That's okay. That's okay. With PL 100-690, it's a road map to show you where they were going with all their plans. And as I've said, it's a bridge. It's a door. It's a, or half a door or half of a wall. The other half comes in with a crime bill. When they come together, it's like the Berlin Wall. It's up rock solid. Well, they had to create a national debt. That's what the wars were for that we've seen, especially Vietnam and most assuredly Korea. And the next Korea might be the topping point. But we've gotten to the point with our national debt that we don't even pay the principal. We can't pay the principal anymore. This young man's grandsons, granddaughters, and great-grandsons are going to be paying the debt that's been created, and they still won't be able to finish it. Now, let me ask you something. Anybody here buy a new car last several years? If you did, if you didn't pay for it in three months, what happens? If or sooner, somebody comes and takes it, don't they? It's called repossession. It's an embarrassing situation, but it happens. Now, if you can't pay for that car and you can't pay the interest, somebody is going to come and take the car away. If you do not pay for your house, somebody is going to come and force you out of the house and take your house. Well, if a nation is in debt, and this nation cannot pay its debt, I will ask you, what does the nation have to give away in exchange for the fabricated debt that now exists? Sovereignty and land. What we stand on, they don't make any more of. Okay? Land is the key. They want, as a gentleman said in Virginia Beach, and it was a perfect analogy, what they want to do is put a piece of paper between you and your property. By having done so with taxes, 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 and more taxes, they have literally put a piece of uh, a writ between you and the property that originally was yours and yours for life. We are virtually communist in this country right now because that again is one of the planks of the Communist Manifesto. Property rights do not exist in the Communist Manifesto. Property taxes to take the property from the people are essential. Ah, see? We're, we're farther down the road than we think. Well, with the national debt, at one point in time, they are going to foreclose. And for the first time in our history, we can't pay it. That's why things have accelerated so quickly. A lot of people ask me, boy, Mark, they're being pretty bold. They're just going ahead and doing whatever they want, aren't they? Yes, they are. And they're going to continue to move even faster. In fact, I, I warn you of this. They are in such a panic that, in fact, I'm not sure they know which way to turn in many ways. I believe, first of all, and I will remind you, the Bilderberger meeting was last week. That's why Bill Clinton was in Europe, not just for the D-Day celebrations. He ascended through the different stations. And if you look at his itinerary, and we don't have it all yet, but if you look at the way he moved through Europe, 
he ascended through all of the different stations in meeting to come up to a, a single point where he, first of all, obviously reported situations and conditions, I am sure, and he received his marching orders as to what must be done in the United States. Uh, Bill Clinton is a Bilderberger, by the way. He was not just invited as a fellow traveler. He is a Bilderberger. It's in his, his references. As a Bilderberger, he was sitting in Oxford here. Has anybody, did anybody see this? It was uh, done live, and it was also covered by C-SPAN and CNN in recording. He sat to the right of the president of Oxford. And the president of Oxford said this, and I want to get it right, but I'll be paraphrasing a little bit. He said, for the fir of all the presidents that they have had, implying that they've been under their control, of all the presidents that we have had, for the first time, this man is truly our president. This from the president of Oxford and from that circle, what they were stating is, is the queen's man. The queen's man. That is monarchical England, the old enemy, back again and again and again. Another thing, everybody recall that just a short time ago in February, somebody else was knighted by the queen after the fact? George Bush received his knightship from the queen. They took care of that rather quickly, and he was also awarded for his activities in support of the crown. Well, wait a minute, I thought he was our president. Whoops. You see? So the farther you go, and the more important, the more important it is for them to befuddle our minds and try to make us ignore history, the more we see that history is very relevant. And we have to look at our place in the timeline, which is why I challenge people to do constantly. Find, understand the fact that you are part of history. History isn't something over there on the wall that they charted. You are a walking, breathing legacy of many different actions, of many different, uh, many different nations and traits. You've come together, and at this point in time, as I said earlier, you are the deciding factor in the, in the destiny of this nation now and the world. Because if we fall, the liberty light goes out. If we fall, the nation not only falls, but the ambitions and the hopes of millions of people all over the country. One of our friends, his family, on, his, his wife's family are all Lebanese, second generation, American. Five brothers, they have grandparents in Lebanon right now. They're Christian, not Muslim, but it wouldn't make any difference. With regard to that, they could either have the same position here. They stated, you know, Mark, Actually, we were talking to one of our other people, and we were, we were standing there. He goes, you know, we could go to Lebanon and hide. I could go to Grandpa and Grandma's, and we could sit there, and we could, we could lay in waiting, and we could ignore our citizenship. But if I do so, and they defeat the United States and they destroy us, then it is only a matter of time before the black tide of darkness descends upon that country, too. So I will stay here, and I will keep my family here, and we shall fight. That from a person with only two generations in this country who understands the value of freedom. In fact, they cherish it greatly. An old Polish gentleman, I always refer to this, I don't care how many times I've repeated it, it's like he said, in 1940, he was in Poland, the Germans were coming from one way, and the Russians were coming from the other. His grandfather organized the family, and they walked out of Poland, down through to the Mediterranean, and escaped. The Russians were trying from one direction, the Germans were trying from another, Poland was in between. Well, they got to the United States and settled in Chicago very quickly, and many of the relatives that came over volunteered to go back into the military as quickly as they became citizens here. And some of them weren't citizens, but volunteered for the U.S. military anyway. And they went back and they fought for the country. He said, but Mark, the problem is this. My grandfather had some place to run. There is no place left for us to run. So I, and he said, and he's 80 years old, by the way, now he's 81. He said, I'm 80 years old, and I shall stand and fight also. Well, if a gray-haired grandfather can stand and fight for this nation, sure as hell, I'm going to have to stand up with him and do the same thing. Challenge all of you. <laughs> Not that I'm putting gray-haired grandfathers down. Don't make a mistake about that. In fact, one of the things that uh, is, is, is crucial here is grandpa, grandma, mom, sis, there is going to come a time when we're going to go. 
A lot of you men have already been there once, so one time or another been in uniform, and may have even fought an enemy on a foreign battlefield. It is sad that we now perceive, and in fact can conceive, of that aggression taking place here. But it is realistic. Well, when the time comes, you people are going to have to be like iron. You're going to have to hug your husband, kiss your brother goodbye. You're going to have to send him out the door with a boot. Well, I don't mind if you come along. But we also need to have some people here to help take care of the families when the time comes. I'll, I'll take all the help I can get, and I won't refuse anything, trust me. But when that time comes, the soldiers also are going to have to do something, and that's steal their heart. That happened all through the South and the North in a war that we all remember. When it took place, you only look back once and go on down the road and do your job. Because that's the only thing you can do to preserve the nation. Is there great risk? Wives, daughters, trust me, in our hearts and in our minds, you are constantly there. You are the reason we fight. You're also a fear that we have because we don't know when we leave what's going to happen to you. And so as you said, yes, you'll come with us, but if you stay behind, be like iron, fight, fight, and fight again. You will have to stand for the family and the household. If we fall in battle, it's important to remember that somebody record what we have done, that you teach the children that what we did was not a stupid or foolish sacrifice, but that we tr truly in our hearts stood for the nation, stand for the republic, and will fight and if need be die for our families. That is our job. You know, I'm pretty blessed because, of course, the last person I hugged wasn't my uh, best friend but my wife when I left. And as some of our people know, there was a great debate about coming here today, for instance. The situation is not what it was a year ago to travel the country now. Fortunately, my wife's got a big iron boot. And although she wanted to come along, I said, you better stay with the kids, and she kicked me out the door. So I'm blessed to the fact that I have a, a fantastic wife who's been very understanding and has put up with the fact that we've invested everything into this. We've, we've in fact, I've put my heart, my soul, and my life into it. We could be standing off to the side. Thank you. We could be standing off to the side, but if we did, wouldn't the black wave catch us wherever we tried to hide to? So being a realist and also being faithful to my pledge, which was to protect and defend the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, small enemies, both foreign and domestic, that I will stand. And when I do, if the, if the need be fall, if I fall, the next question I ask is, who shall pick up the flag when I do? Will any of you? Yes or no? And I have nothing to fear. What are you going to threaten me with, heaven? <laughs> Lindsey Williams said that, and I use it all the time because it's true. We are fighting a righteous cause, by the way, and I truly believe that. And oh, I can be salty with the rest of you. But I thoroughly believe in my heart. One of the things that people have asked, and I, I want to stress this, yes, pray. Please pray. Because it's the prayers of all of you that have keep, kept me alive and kept me going for a long time. People say, how could they let you travel like this? Why would they let you go? Well, don't think that they haven't tried in different occasions. And don't think that there aren't people who wouldn't like to see me dead in a heartbeat. But there's a great spirit and a great hand that stands between them, I think. And I have a great faith in that. And I believe that in the long run, at one time or another, I'm going to get to stand before my creator. And he also is, you know, we've, we've, we've argued this before with many good Christians. I will not argue the Christian, any, any Christian with a variation in faith here. But I will say this, that yes, I will do violence when violence is necessary. And that I know for a fact that I, have, I will stand before my creator with a clean conscience, knowing that I've done everything in my power to try and come up with a peaceful solution to this. But that when the time comes, that I will use force and that I must use force because it was granted to me by God to make the decision as to whether or not we would be free or slaves. And I, for one man, am a free, for one, am a free man and I will stay free no matter what. Now, our enemy, and a real enemy, a very tangible enemy, is all over the nation. Before in the past, we've talked about foreign movements, foreign troops, what their capabilities are, what could they be doing, Mark, why would they be here? Well, I think almost all of you have seen some of the photographs now 
which are about as tangible as you're going to get short of walking up and, and, and banging on the hull of a T-72 or banging on the hull of a Russian truck sitting in Mississippi or Alabama or sitting in Florida. The numbers are staggering. The numbers are there. The resources are there. In Alabama, uh, in Louisiana, in Mississippi, in Florida, in Montana, as a matter of fact, I want to pass this around. And again, I trust all you people, so I think I'll get it back. We have the patriots from across the nation who have accumulated a tremendous amount of information, but this was the most fascinating, uh, most recent photos that we have from the area. If armored personnel carriers with UN printed on the side isn't enough for you, I don't know what is. They've been debarked in Montana itself. Now, I'll pass these around. All the vehicles that are in these photographs are foreign. All the vehicles, as this intelligence report states, were dropped off in the United States. They did not leave the state of Montana. And they're now garrisoned in different, in different parts of the state. And thank God we have good patriots like that all over the nation. In Florida, through the, uh, an exercise which people tried to poo-poo called the Agile Provider, not only Florida, but your state of Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, North and South Carolina, also Virginia, and strangely enough, the state of Arkansas. What does that have to do with coastal states? We all know who's from Arkansas, though, don't we? Uh, Agile Provider, one of its activities was forced entry of uh, private dwellings and forced entry of property. This is part of an ongoing program to try and incorporate more and more people into house-to-house -house search and seizure activities when they take place, not if. In fact, it's stated uncategorically with many different publications now that there is a need to disarm the American people. If you read regional papers, notice I didn't say national papers, I said regional papers, you will find that depending on how they tailor the story, they are very overt about their intentions to take the weapons from the American people. That is their first concern, because they can't get away with it. We have 80 million armed Americans, reliably. Now, I'm not trying to discourage you, but I want you all to be realistic here, too. Six out of seven will surrender their weapons. Six out of seven Americans, despite what they say, will surrender their weapons. But don't be discouraged. I still use old world, old, old earth math, not new age math. If you do some quick math there, that's 10 million plus combatants. They're hardcore, they're resolute, and even under the worst of conditions, they will not surrender what they have. No military force can field that many soldiers in one place at one time successfully. And as all of you know, we live here. A little different when you walk into my backyard. I don't plan on letting you go. In fact, I'm like an alligator. I'll hang on to your ass until they walk you right back out. <laughs> okay? That's right. Now, one of the things that's interesting about that is, is people have asked me about the Guard and the Reserve and the Army. I'll cover that very quickly. Most recent, and we've got vampire killers here, and again, make copies, buy copies, whatever you can do, make more, and give them to law enforcement, give them to soldiers, give them to anybody you can find, fire departments. A lot of fire departments are being armed now, aren't they? Ah, some people go, huh? Yes, what they're doing is they're trying to arm and get, get armed as many people as they can so they can conscript them into operations. Well, we had a series of MPPW command operations uh, two weeks ago, as a matter of fact, in Michigan at Fort Custer Military Reservation. And mystery of mysteries, a bunch of tapes and things appeared with the unit commanders and with some of the other soldiers. Well, the company commanders, by, our, by reports that are firsthand, actually had the men come together, read the documents, watch the tapes, and then the lieutenants and captains in charge said this, and this is word for word, when they come and give us an order to fire on American citizens to take their property, we shall turn and shoot the people who give the orders. Yeah. Oh, thank God. Too. And don't think it isn't going to happen either. I like the crusty, salty, my favorite kind of gunnery sergeant who stepped up to the podium when we were up in the central part of Michigan. He said, Mark, you don't know how many friends you have out there in uniform. He's in charge of 200 men and fire, that control a tremendous amount of firepower. They're into mate, weapons maintenance, and they're all his. 
So you all know where he's going to go with that. Those are patriots. Those are men who remember what oath they swore and whose nation they're in and what nation they're a part of. Now the reserve, well, the reserve's being attacked in many ways, but the reserve will be federalized very quickly. Still, they breathe, they eat, they sleep with us. They're married to some of you. And they all realize something's wrong, too. Many young captains, many majors, in some cases, I will allude to this, even general staff officers have talked with us. This is not a thing that's happening just with the lower ranks. There are many people concerned and understand full well that the storm is coming, and they must decide whether they will be Americans also. Trust me, most of them are going the right way. The active army, well, I'll tell you what you can do. They're sending a lot of troops to Korea, okay? You can send a care package to Korea, you know that? In care of any soldier. Now, anybody who's been in the military knows that if you send something like this after about two days, if you leave it in the bathroom especially, it's going to be dog-eared. Okay? It's going to be worn. There's going to be fingerprint marks over it and everything. Because when you're in a war zone or if you're in any kind of garrison situation, you're desperate for things to read. So if you could make this one of your efforts anywhere overseas in Somalia where there's still some troops there, which we did, by the way, Yugoslavia, Europe, Asia, and specifically Korea in care of any soldier through, uh, through an Army post office box, Navy post office, etc. Send them a care package. Put a comb in there put some candy in there, and don't, please, don't put things that melt. Trust me, you hate it when that stuff comes out of the box. Yuck. Ugh. I've had it happen myself. But, uh, yes? Yes, the USO would give you points and locations, who to send to, in care of any soldier. But if you have a certain person that you can name, send it to them. Sometimes there is a list. Thank you. There is a list of the USO of people who are overseas. Huh? Well, let me explain to you how to eliminate that problem. First of all, let's be creative. The government does not mind pornography, but they do like intelligence. Okay, I mean, should they, they, they like, I'm sorry, they like pornography, but they don't like good intelligence like this. So go out and get one of these cover jackets for one of these little porno flicks that are about $9 a piece. Take the pornography tape and go like that for the few dollars you have to spend. Take an American peril tape and stick it inside and close it. <laughs> now, now, granted, the soldier will be disappointed. <laughs> I guarantee this. But I almost guarantee that that tape will go through. You want to know why? Because they don't mind if they get all kinds of pornography. They don't mind if, they're, you know, if their mind's going that way. But they sure as heck mind if they're thinking. And that's what you want to do. And you can, we've already dropped a lot of bombs off that way, so to speak. In other words, they go out. We don't know where they go. We aren't even sure if they're successful. But if you make a copy of the tape, it costs you what? $1.80, $2, $3, whatever you're going to do, plus shipping. Oh, boy, another $2. $5 worth of insurance policy to preserve the Constitution. I'd say that's pretty cheap. And if you send literature, the thing to do is make it a big gobbledygook package. Chances are nobody wants to get into it. Throw in a t-shirt, spare t-shirts and underpants. Trust me, soldiers always like those things. In mediums or, you know, like a little towards the large size. A t-shirt. Oh, there's a neat t-shirt right here. Like I said, <laughs> here's a neat t-shirt to send over there. You think they'll wear it? Okay, send one of these over there. God bless the Republic, death of the New World Order. What are they going to do? Hang them for wearing an American flag and speaking their mind? Well, probably they'll try. But as you'll recall from uh, Desert Storm, for instance, uh, some of the American soldiers, Marines especially, were covered on film. And it was a live piece that was done on C-SPAN, and it's amazing it even got through and it didn't last long. But they came up to this Marine with a camera, and you know, the camera's going back and forth, and they, they come up to the guy and say, well, what are you here fighting for, young Marine? And of course, they're expecting him to go, oh, yeah, I'm here for the da 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 he, reach, he looks around like this, and he's in a fox, he's in a, he's in a trench. He looks around and he reaches into his pocket and he pulls out an American flag with all the threads tattered off it because they forced him to take it off his uniform. He says, you see this? This is what I'm fighting for. And two Marines rushed in from the side and they started pointing at the flag. Yeah, yeah, that's what we're fighting for. The hell with the southern garbage, that's what we're fighting for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's patriotism. They will wear the flag. Now, you've got to remember, they wouldn't let us wear our flag, but the British, the French, and the Italians all wore theirs. There were lieutenants who were sent around to take the flag down off vehicles every time they put an American flag up. But they wouldn't do that to the French, the British, or the Canadians, or anybody else. So obviously, they knew who the New World Order threat was, didn't they? U.S., us, right here. Literature is important. Tapes are important. If you want to, again, it'll discourage, it'll disappoint them a little, but if you want to, make audio tapes. Put a different jacket on the thing. Put it in a different box. 
ship it overseas. They plug it in. They're not going to like what they hear right away, but they'll listen to it because, again, they're a captive audience. Where are you going to go? What are you going to listen to? And eventually you're going to be curious. Well, wait a minute. That makes sense. That makes sense. Well, I've seen that. Well, I've seen that too. Oh, no. <laughs> now I understand. That creates something very dangerous, an armed and intelligent soldier. He knows what to do. Can't complain about that at all. What else can you send them? Why not send them something they're supposed to be fighting for? By the way, do you know where this one came from? Oh, yes, right. Thank you. This came from the GPO, Government Printing Office. Your government made these and were supposed to give them out for free because they were given as a grant, a gift to the American people. What happened is, when Clinton came into office, he declared that they were to charge for these. Now, mind you, they've already been paid for, so you're paying for them a second time when you get them, unfortunately. But still, they're worth it. It's right. They're worth it. It doesn't make a difference. But it's fascinating. Send something like this to them. It'll make them wonder, and they will read it. One of the things that I did, and you might want to do also, is if you go through here and find the Declaration of Independence, and I've already, most people have seen it, and there's, a, there's some yellow in here already, I want you to go through and in your own mind take the Declaration of Independence and check off what you recognize as part of the tyranny of today. If you want to know what the guideline is for your enemy as far as what he's doing, why he's doing it, and how he's doing it, here it is. You will find, if you, do it just, if you don't do it while thinking and just go through and check them off and then go back and pull the book away from you and open the page, you'll find that you'll see whole yellow sections of this book. This is the guideline they're using against you. And so for that reason, it's obvious that we have, a, we, have a, we have a cause to fight for. And this is enough right here. You don't need anything else. This is enough. I'm certainly armed with more. Now, very quickly, I'm going to pass this around because I know we're late in the, in the hour here. This is another document. Some people said the MJTF doesn't exist. I've been fighting this tooth and nail for the last three and a half years. People know that. Uphill battle all the way. Oh, there's no such thing as the MJTF police. What does that say right there? It says 22 MJTF police units in Michigan alone. And that is from the Michigan State Police. They can no longer hide it. So now they're going to try and divert the information. Interesting, isn't it? Yes. All of, oh, you are here now, Cherokee County, too? Yep. Yes, we, oh yes, we would. We'll take it, if we can take it with us, it'd be great. If you can pass that around, you get a chance. There are several elements. Michigan is not the largest. There are many MJTF police units throughout the nation. They have been around for years. And they originally were incepted back in 89 when they were brought together. They are usurping more and more power. One of the ways that they're getting into your houses and your, and your neighborhoods, by the way, is money. Your local township needs a little extra cash to buy some weapons. That's the one thing they're going for right now. We'll buy you MP5s. What you ought to do if you've got a good township police, police commissioner or chief or if you have a good sheriff, tell them, we don't want the weapons. We'd like the money. Just send us the cash. Then you go out and buy a snot load of all the neat weapons you really did need, and you can buy ten times as much for the same amount of money rather than buying the MP5s. And trust me, you'll get all the AKs and MP5s later you need. It's not that hard. Trust me. They're being carried by all those other characters. Now, there's a packet that was given to me, which is excellent, and I please, I would also like this back. And again, it was, it's his original copy, too, or what, not original, but a copy of his a first copy. The trucks we were discussing in Biloxi, we have aerial photographs of. There's a picture here of some of the trucks. They were chemical warfare, fuel trucks, and equipment. Also, command and control vehicles. There's the facility that they're near. Also, a very interesting picture here, because this thing was hell-bent for election heading down Florida's highways, and I don't doubt it, we've had other reports, T-72 tanks that were being transported. Now, at this time, as an update to what's happened down in Mississippi and in Louisiana, before I forget, this is my little lumber yard here, you notice I'm shifting for a minute, there are 14 ships anchored off New Orleans that have been photographed from the air by the Patriots there. They've got a little interesting uh, service they use to identify threats like this, and they actually photograph them. There are 14 ships with armor on board, including armor that is being uh, housed on the decks. Armored personnel carriers and main battle tanks. They have been shipping them in through uh, the New Orleans ports and then up through the bayous to other sites, including the NASA site that's listed here that's photographed. And these 14 ships are debarking equipment now. 
the site that most people of you heard about that originally was debarking all the Russian trucks, 2,100 of them minimum. We think now there's a total of 2,400, and many of them are being shipped to other parts of the country. Of those, they are now expecting armor and armored, pers armored, armored vehicles of all types, including tanks, to be dropped off within the next week, possibly two. They've already been informed to expect heavier payloads and heavier pieces of equipment. Again, I will remind you, we have vast numbers of foreign troops. We have reports which are reliable firsthand of anywhere from 20 to 40,000 personnel in Florida at different sites. We have an additional uh, 20 to 25,000 mixed personnel at Fort Polk, Louisiana, which is no longer a U.S. military facility. Fort Polk is United Nations Training Command, North America. It has been so since last fall and was publicly announced. Fortunately, we made an announcement about it before they did. So down in the area, people started to wake up as we had, pre we had pre premonitions of this and what they would do. Fort Dix is also another facility that has been transferred over. Another interesting thing that's taking place right now, we want you to keep an eye on our aircraft. You'll see a lot of strange things flying in your skies right now, and most of them are not American. Out west in Oklahoma City, we have a brief report that's very accurate showing the construction of a transfer facility right off the airport. The original cover story is that that facility was supposed to be used to transport people like Manuel Noriega and a few other characters, a very small facility. It now can handle probably over 10,000 individuals at one time, has a docking port that can ho hook up to an existing aircraft pulling up right next to this prison off the runway, and could transport, of course, unlimited numbers of people. And you could house more than 10,000 if you stand them up. There's a variety of different detention camp uh, projects that are going. So again, something we talked about, people have been trying to contest in a pig's eye. It's happening now. Nobody can debate it. The only thing they can try to do now is divert our attention. Those operations are taking place everywhere from New York to Florida, from Florida, of course, to your own state here. Uh, we will be able to reproduce the packages to give you an idea of what's happening. Uh, many of the good patriots have actually documented by mapping coordinate giving us copies of the maps to identify the site, photographs of the site, and also nomenclature and information that was available there concerning who's involved, what agencies, or military formations. Four, who are they going to put in the camps? Well, who's going to be a criminal? Us, U.S. Who's the perceived enemy? And how long have we been the perceived enemy? There are people here are familiar with the 1933 Act, uh, the, uh, the 1933 uh, document signed by FDR, rescinding all of the trading with the enemy clauses except one with regard to defining who the perceived enemy was, and that perceived enemy is the American people, as signed by the War Powers Act of about 19, four, 1916, I'm sorry, and still in power today. It has never left us. So obviously we're fighting somebody alien to this nation, and we're going to have to deal with that problem accordingly when the time comes. Now what we're going to do, I think we're going to take a break here very soon. Is that okay? Okay, what I think we're going to do, because we're not, we're not going to throw you all out, I'm sure everybody's getting a little restless, what I'd like to do is take a break. You all want to come back? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. We'll take 10 minutes. I hope there isn't too long a line out there, OK? <laughs> Thank you. Are we ready? Everybody set? Yes? All right, good. Well, very quickly, there were a few things. Uh, of course, there were many questions that were asked while we were kind of walking off the side taking a break. I asked that anybody who could to re either repeat the questions they asked, or if you have a question, please come up and ask, because, like I said, I have lumberyard syndrome. If you jog it once in a while, I'll find out where the 2 by 2s and the 4 by 4s are stored. It just takes time to move things around. We have a lot of information, and, uh, and again, what I like to do with the question and answer is to make sure that you people find out what it is that you came here to ask about. So I certainly can talk about a lot of things, but there are, there are many subjects. Yes, please. We'll start right from the front. Okay, you uh, talked to you about the black helicopters and the signs on the interstate and the lesser highways. Yes. Okay, what well, the question was, asking about the black helicopters, which we have talked about. 
quite a bit. Also, the markings on the signs, which many people may or may not have seen. First of all, the black helicopter syndrome is you know, like the black plague fell down upon us probably about the late part of 88, 89 when they first started to appear. In late 88, early 89, small numbers of these types of vehicles were identified and questioned by a lot of people. We knew what our normal paint configurations were for Air Guard, Air Reserve, regular Air Force, and even some foreign military formations. I've been both a, I've worked both as an intelligence analyst, 96B, and as a 97C counterintelligence coordinator. And I've also worked as a training officer for a good portion of the last 20 years at different times in different capacities. And I'm very familiar with the units and forces and formations that we've had in the United States. I've trained with foreign forces. In fact, when I was at U6, U.S. Army Intelligence Center in schools, majority of the people that I worked with were foreign personnel. Many defectors and also many people that we trained in limited numbers. Limited not battalions, not even company strength units. In most cases, now the company is only 120 people, by the way, or roughly 120. Normally, we would have liaison personnel who would manage these troops. They were brought in to train in our particular schools. We also do this at Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, in the Carolinas. We have also have troops, foreign troops, that have been trained in Texas, for instance. Well, Fort Devens, one of the other intelligence facilities, also trains foreign personnel in limited numbers. The largest contingent of West German pr personnel that we had at any given time never exceeded 20. And that was at U6 for the entire facility, including all classes. And they were the largest class of the bunch, the largest group. So much so that they actually had a small embassy on the, on the post, or a mock embassy. What we saw was a radical change in that we were seeing more and more conventional forces under arms operating inside the United States to condition us. We argued that back years ago, that that would be the ulterior motive. And we are seeing it now more and more. Now, along with the foreign forces came this change in policy with regard to the marking of aircraft. Now, the black helicopter served several purposes, but I will refer to one point, Orwell, 1984, the book. I challenge you all to go home and read it tonight and then shudder once you're done. And I don't want you to just read the book. I want you to read the glossaries, the indexes, and everything else because he talked about this. Why is Orwell important? Orwell was an insider. He was a member, he remember he was educated, he was involved with Oxford, the same place that our present president was involved with. He was involved with the British Fabian Society, which are Fabian socialists, which are the type of socialists you're dealing with right now. The ones with the big smiley face with fangs. They don't really have a symbol. Well, with the helicopters, the objective behind black, and this is to give you an overview first of all, the reason for black is nondescript. Black is synonymous in this case with, you know, with again, aggression, with uh, harbingers of evil, the death angel, etc. Helicopters, of course, you don't necessarily know where the pilot's looking, but if an aircraft is hovering over an area, the fear is that it's looking at you. And obviously, if you've been indoctrinated with the media, the concept is, well, it must be looking at me. Okay, so it creates an air of oppression. Orwell talked about this also, by the way, in the use of helicopters effectively. This is back in the 40s when helicopters were not predominant. Now, the change in the aircraft took place for one of, uh, well, initially for one of two reasons. The aircraft were going to be used below their normal flying envelope. Anybody here who is a private pilot knows full well that there are specific limitations for minimal flying distances above both man-made and, natu man -made and natural objects. You'll note that almost all of these aircraft are in direct violation of almost every federal aviation guideline that exists. We've had farmers that have had their cows buzzed, have their you know, chickens scattered, they had their crops damaged. Uh, we've had them sit over houses no taller than the distance from my head to the uh, top of this uh, ceiling right here. Now, with those, with those situations, normally what you do if you were uh, Farmer Fred and you saw the helicopter go by and the cattle spread out to the wind and they're all dairy cows, You'd watch the helicopter as it goes by, look at the boom and see 69938. Pick up your phone, dial the Aviation Bureau, and say, hey, I just had Johnny Jet Jock uh, buzz my cows, and I've lost milk for three days. I want the forms. I want, to, I want to find these people. I want money for what you've done. And they could do it legally. In fact, there was a whole program that was set up specifically. That's why the aircraft were marked inside the continental United States. We are not at war in the, oh, well, maybe you are at war. Oops. See, who is the perceived enemy? We are the perceived enemy. 
That's why the markings had to come off also for lack of intelligence collection. Remember that there are a wide number of aircraft being used. Many of you who are prior military will recognize that many of the aircraft are older variants on aircraft that we thought were retired. Example, predominantly the UH-1B, the old baby Huey as we called it, remember, has been brought back out of the mothball fleet and the target fleets, which were located in Arizona, New Mexico, and also in Illinois. 3,000 aircraft were brought out of reserve, out of not our Army and Air Force Reserve, but out of strategic reserve inventories and transferred over for these operations to FinCEN, MJTF police, etc., etc., and also UN forces. This did not give them state of the art, but it gave them a lot of aircraft, which is what they needed, including Chinooks, etc., CH 47s, which are the big heavy lift aircraft some people are familiar with, with a rotor front and rear, capable of transporting roughly 64 to 67 people at a time. These aircraft were then deployed accordingly by region. Remember, you're dealing with a regional government, not with the U.S. government and were assigned to the particular units. The letter that I passed around explaining, for instance, MJTF operations, as they will finally admit to, and I will remind you, that letter admits to only 22 formations. I guarantee, as a rule with intelligence, if they've admitted to that much, it's only because they can't hide those anymore, and there are far more out there that you haven't even seen yet, and that we don't even know about. The helicopters are then, of course, deployed. Uh, probably some of the most interesting examples. Remember when the kids were lost up here in the Smoky Mountain Forest from Michigan? You all remember how they found them? They sent out black helicopters, didn't they? If you'll recall, and I'm from Michigan, not far from where those kids were brought back because they were from that area, from the Detroit metropolitan area. When, before they would release them, they said that the children would not be released until they were debriefed by the government. Well, what kind of combat operations are these kids on? What is it that they, uh, the pilots and the other individuals were so scared of that they were afraid these kids might talk about later? After all, they were 11, 12, and 13-year-olds, some a little older, and there were two adults. So obviously something else was going on. Well, to tie into that, remember the Smoky Mountain Forest isn't the Smoky Mountain Forest anymore. It's the Smoky Mountain International Biosphere. It says so on all the signs when you go in. It is under United Nations authority and control. And any time you go into a national park, most people go whizzing by those brown and yellow signs that are cut out of wood. When you go into a national park, I challenge you to slow down and read what it says. Many of our national parks have become international biospheres because they have been transferred by the, through the IMF to international authority to pay for your debt. And that's why they're no longer ours. Bottom line, you have to pay with it with something. They've been paying with U.S. property, specifically parklands, which are federal authority. Now, the black helicopters started showing up there. We've counted as many, to give you an idea, during their peak last year with four observers that we trained. We trained people how to observe. Four, four observers sit standing back to back. We had three columns in excess of 60 aircraft per column in, with my convenient map of Michigan here, in the, uh, under the thumb area just north of Flint, Michigan, over here. Now, we've had other, many other aircraft sighted constantly. Some of them are involved, some, and I will say, again, not this many, this many, are involved in marijuana, inter marijuana interdiction. I could get off into a whole diatribe about that because I understand more about, about our history with regard to marijuana, a name which was made up and did not exist until it was needed. Originally, it was called weed. We all know of it as hemp. Remember which you made ropes out of? Many of you who were servicemen used it during the war. Hemp was also used to make something else which is now very destructive. Whoops, I'm sorry, I gotta pick that up. Um, paper. Strangely enough, the story and it's very it was very accurately put together, and I do not doubt it for a minute. Um, and this is why they have to have the helicopter interdiction to get rid of that evil weed, which is really one of its old nicknames. Marijuana, which was hemp, which was called hemp, was a cash crop not for drugs, but as a cash crop for the farmer to keep him afloat. If you couldn't grow anything else on your land and your land was garbage, you threw the weed, uh, the, the seed on the ground and it'd grow by itself. Rather than going to the bank for a loan every year, you used hemp as a cash product like they did tobacco and many other crops to finance the rest of the farm. Didn't smoke it, didn't all those guys probably did to a certain extent, but again, it's one of those crimes you gotta question every once in a while. They didn't smoke it, but they did use it to keep the farm afloat. Well, just strangely enough, J.P. Morgan, the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds had a lot of money invested in timberland. 
that was not being used, nor would it be used. Why? Because we had more than enough lumber to keep all of our houses and construction going for hundreds of years to come. Hemp was the number one competitor in the, uh, for the paper production. So what they did is they created a campaign to get rid of hemp by calling it marijuana. And we all know the whole process. We're familiar with some of the other history there about what was done. Well, at it, it, first it didn't dawn on me what this, how important this was. But let me ask you something. Are you all familiar with the fact that this paper has a time bomb in it? You know that after a period of time, this paper will disintegrate on its own because of its acid content. There are particular, particular enzymes in all the paper and all your books on every shelf that you have, unless they were made in the 20s or earlier, that guarantees that those books will disintegrate on their own. Now, at the time when this was done, what was the primary way that you preserved knowledge in the United States? Written paper and books. They destroyed the written word of the day and ensured that it was put on, on documental material that would not preserve the information. That is not an accident. That's virtually what Orwell was talking about, the memory hole. It served other purposes, too, and not only that, but put a lot of coffers into the Morgan and uh, J.P. Morgan and many other uh, uh, banks and, of course, helped to finance the New World Order we see today. How does that involve the helicopters? Marijuana is their primary concern, in other words, hemp. Who would have believed, and I have never, I will say this also right now, I'm going to document this again, we're doing this constantly. So whenever you say that you found drugs in my house, you didn't. I have never used any drugs at all in my life. I've never even used marijuana, and I didn't have to worry about inhaling.